We've all been there, in the middle of a job, everything going smoothly, until boom, you're missing a part. United Refrigeration is your one-stop shop for all your refrigeration needs. Use your computer or smartphone to go to www.uri.com at any time of the day or night to check stock on your favorite brands, such as Copeland, Sporlin, Carlisle Compressors, Danfoss, Emerson CPC Boards and Sensors, Carell, Hussman Parts, and k -Therm. United Refrigeration Inc. is home to these brands and many more. Looking for information on refrigerant conversions or refrigerant banking? Quick access links on the homepage can get you to the information you need. All approved accounts are able to see live to the minute inventory and pricing. Product not in stock at your local branch? No problem. Use the nearby stock feature to find a local branch that does have what you need. Are you looking for a branch address, phone number, or after hours number? That's all available as well. Just click on the branch locator and search for your local branch. Have a model number and looking for a replacement part? www.uri.com forward slash ARP has a vast list of quick pick replacement parts. Just search for the model number of the equipment you're working on and click the replacement parts tab. If you don't have an account, click the register button and we'll have you online in no time. With more than 400 locations in North America, each United Refrigeration branch is fully stocked for immediate pickup. Our branch employees have in-depth technical knowledge so we can help you get what you need when you need it. Visit your local store or www.uri.com forward slash ARP today. United Refrigeration Inc has all your solutions down cold. The Sporland Division of Parker Hannifin Corporation is sponsoring this podcast. Sporland is the leading manufacturer of HVAC and R components. Using quality materials and craftsmanship, Sporland maintains a commitment to innovation, manufacturing excellence, service, and support for its customers since 1934. The company is known for its catch-all filter dryers, thermostatic expansion valves, solenoid valves, pressure regulating valves, suction filters, electric valves, controllers, supermarket monitoring solutions, chemicals, smart service tools, ZoomLock Max Press to Connect, and ZoomLock Push, Push to Connect Refrigerant Fittings. If folks want to learn more, what do they do? Uh, you can go to Sporland.com. I guess that's Jim and John for Sporland signing off. Hello, guys. This episode is brought to you by Fieldpiece. Fieldpiece's next generation of vacuum pumps will cut down on evacuation time and make oil changes on the fly a breeze. They are lightweight, durable, and feature four inline ports plus a large oil reservoir. Get pumped about these three new Fieldpiece vacuum pumps available at distributors now. Learn more at fieldpiece.com or follow us on social media at Fieldpiece Products. Thanks again and thanks for listening. Uh, thank you. Thank you and uh, welcome for the moment. Uh, listen, I really feel bad about this, but I have a special announcement. Hey, maybe we've gotten lucky at last. Yeah, maybe tonight's show has been canceled. <laughs> uh, tonight's show has been canceled. <laughs> Have I died and gone to heaven? Now, okay, you two, take the night off. Uh, now, we might as well bring up the house lights and say goodnight to everybody. Welcome, everybody, to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You're here with your host, Brett Wetzel and Kevin Compass. What's up, buddy? Oh, living the dream. Out of town, started up a CO2 store that is an absolute disaster. Well, that's why you're doing it. Yeah, well, yep. The electrician really, uh, really got me good today. Really, really got me good. Why is that? Oh, he started the network in like five different places. And like every label he put on every wire was the same label. <laughs> like literally every single label is the same. Well, hold on. I've seen those. I've seen those schematics before. Sometimes, you know, they'll have 
you know, it'll all be labeled zero for the start. You know what I mean? For, for, no, no, this guy labeled everything, uh, A53, A, B, C. Which What's is wrong the, with that? Which is the first case that the combine went to. Oh, uh, okay. So he just kept labeling every one of them A, A53, A, B, C. <laughs> and you're doing S3Cs, right? So you don't know which one. Uh, SE3 is core links, uh, uh, XM controllers, you name it, it's got it. <laughs> Whatever flavor you want. All we're missing is a Dan Foss controller. Well, you probably have one, right? You have a, uh, you have a 320. No, no, you don't. You have the fucking. <laughs> you can't even override the, the valve positions. <laughs> Why do you say that? It just doesn't work. You can't override anything. You can't like change any hardly anything. You can't use the to change anything or override it. This doesn't work. You try to call someone to see if you know there was a magic button. No. And well, you're you're dealing with CPC, so just hook everything up to the uh, to either the analog output and the uh, and the ESR board. Yeah. Well, it, they don't have a COP chart in there for mm. CO2 and it's critical. So lame. So let's finish the rest of this uh, CO2 startup. Where do we leave off? Do you remember? Uh, we started introducing cases, if I wasn't mistaken correctly. Okay. So, guys, right, we're going to dive right back into this, which is what I'm doing all day tomorrow. So we're going to start bringing on our caseload. So once we crack up, we want to slowly start bringing on the caseload. Now, you want to either do this with the EMS or switches. If you have switches at the rack, it's amazing. But most of the time, you don't. I got my beep button ready. <laughs> <laughs> just when you start talking, I'm just going <laughs> to. So, <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to start bringing them on slowly, either through the EMS. I usually overwrite everything off. And then I'll start bringing them on like case by case and let them start cooling down. Glass doors. You got to kind of, you know, feather it a little bit, medium temp. It's not as bad. I mean, it usually cools down pretty quick, but I will usually bring the medium temp loads down first. So that way the flash tank and uh, I am not, you know, bombarding the medium temp suction. I could just, you know, bring the medium temp down first and then start to low temp up. <clears throat> so I'm not right. bombarding the suction. Once again, just to cover this, what what percentage would you say, of the medium temp so you don't have cycling issues um what percentage of the medium temp would you recommend running before you start bringing on the low temps you mean like down to temp like yeah like, temp i mean like how much like, no, no, like percentage of the load like let's just say you know with all these case issues not coming in on time you know stuff not being built whatever um you know what what's the percentage before you start cracking on the low temp compressors i'm not turning the thing on unless the whole store is piped Okay. It, it all needs to be piped and functional before, unless you're like, well, we're doing, I mean, we're doing the complete opposite of what I'm saying. Like we've hardly got to do any functionality tests and we'll see how it goes tomorrow. But I mean, we're, we're pretty confident in the actual case sensors, this particular, these particular cases, every, for some reason, every evaporator outlet temp sensor, there's three of them per Husband case, but they're all different colors and they're, they're home run all the way through. So, the they look to all be landed right yeah just make sure with those if you guys are starting up those core link cases with the um, with the multiple sensors make sure that the ground where all the sensors connect to is tight because unfortunately you know unlike most controllers where you have a positive and negative terminal on a case controller on the core link you do not they all share a common so i've had you know where they butt all the connections together before they shove it in the controller. Cause they'll, they'll wire up three or four wires and then, you know, connect it in with a, another piece of ground. And I've seen where it's not connected. Good. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think that that's a huge issue with those cases. I am not a fan of those push in terminals. I, I absolutely I hate them. Like I, I was, I was trimming them out all day today and on the core links and like the Dixel stuff. It's, it's real hard to get com wire in there and stuff. It, it doesn't hold it right. 
I it mean, holds it. It's just it's difficult to to get a good connection. You know, if you just have one, you know, uh, more than one connection going in there, unless, like I said, you, you know, basically connect all wires to one wire and then shove it that one wire into there. What I found that works pretty good is those uh, square crimps. Like, mm -hmm. uh, they, they work pretty decent. Unfortunately, the ones you need are like super tiny and they're pain in the ass to fit a bunch of wires in. So, gotcha. but they, they seem to hold up a lot better. But, I mean, that is what it is. But, like, we're going to bring the cases on slowly. So I'm going to start with the medium temp load. I'm going to start, you know, bringing everything down, you know, let it get down to about, you know, 30, 40 degrees, and then I'll bring on the next case, and then I'll bring on the next case, and then the next case. You know, so I, I got almost all of them down the temp. And then I'm going to continue watching the charge in the rack, make sure the flash tank, I'm keeping a ball in there. And I'm watching my oil levels, make sure everything's good. And then I'm going to start up a low temp. And I'm going to go to the same thing. I'm going to let the low temp start up. I'll bring a couple cases on. The low temp, you don't have to do as much like watching it because you're going to – the fans are going to cycle off in the cases on their own. So the, when those coils start cooling down, they're going to start bringing the coils down to temperature. They're going to kick the fans on. Then they'll, they'll, they'll cool the case down a little bit, and then they'll shut off. So, I mean, that helps control the load and the low temp a little bit. So, I mean, just, just let them get down to like 20 and then start bringing on some more cases. Then let those get down to 20 and the other cases should be down to like 10 ish and just bring on some more cases. So, when you're bringing on the low temp, then what do you, um, yeah, obviously, you're, you're putting those at like 35 degrees so you don't heave the floors on the walk ins. Um, how long do you keep that? I mean, I mean, it all depends on how fast the customer wants to start the store, but. You know, typically, what's your rule of thumb for that? How long do you want to hold 35 degrees before you start cranking it down below frozen? I mean, it really depends on what the customer says. I mean, if you want, we had like two, I had two different startups where they said, no, it needs to be filled now. So we want it right down to minus 10. Okay. It's your concrete, not mine. But I, I, mean, I mean, honestly, I've never seen a floor heave in 10 years. Yeah. I've seen a floor heave at a s that was like 30 years old and the forklifts were getting stuck in the middle and it was hilarious. I just realized I'm going to be using this a lot. <laughs> Whatever. You, 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 <laughs> you need to get a little bit faster with that fucking uh, that button. But uh, I mean, the floor in the freezer that like all becomes a nightmare, to be honest to you. Like that is a complete nightmare is staging down the freezer because that is the only low temp load oh so they don't wait a minute they don't it. have any low temp just the freezer then how they so, so it, it runs very poorly because you have a digital compressor and usually two more scrolls i mean it's a big it's a decent sized freezer but the problem is is uh we're we're it becomes a uh it becomes a nightmare because, I mean, you have to raise the suction group up. I mean, in the beginning, you can pretty much run the freezer off the medium tap, and then you got to lower it down. So, like, until you get down to, like, 20 degrees, you hardly even run the scrolls. Like, the digital cycle is like a machine gun. So, I'm, I'm not even confused about that. I understand what you're saying about that, but what I'm confused about is the fact that if they have a frozen food freezer – where are they putting the product for point of sale is where I'm confused at. You've never been in an Aldi? Oh, you never that's, right. that's right. They have the doors. No, no, they have eight and they have AHT cases. Oh, they have like, no, I've only been new at Aldi, I think twice in my life. And that was to go shopping for a cooler. Yeah, so they have like 10 or 11 AHT cases that like are like little coffins. That's where they put all their, you know, point of sale stuff and then uh right. that's yeah. right but so like then they started putting the meat cool so like the freezer being on there it runs kind of poor but like then they started putting the meat coolers on there and when they put the meat coolers on there now we have a disaster because the whole freezer shuts down and defrost so now we have a two fan like thirteen thousand btu meat cooler coil <laughs> with i don't know 20 horse a compressor no, well, you said you said it runs off the the digital, but it just cycles. 
like machine gun on off on off on off it, the meat cooler is not even close to enough load to even run it so it, what we is it placing up a lot because of the tv on that thing uh, so they put a they use a ser a valve as an epr okay they're using that to, to raise the pressure up mm -hmm. but, and at, we, we said i'm now i'm curious x xcr no, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what valve you're talking S about. S They're using an SCR8. Sporlin SCR That's, valve. Has yeah. an EPR? Yeah. yeah. I'm thoroughly, I'm thoroughly confused. Like, I, I would understand using like an SDR, an SDR3. Nope. nope. It's an SERA. That's wild. It's a huge pressure drop. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, they're trying to maintain, say, they're trying to maintain the meat cooler pressure. Say, let's just throw out 350. Okay, well, there's they're running the low temp suction at 210. Mm -hmm. So you have a massive pressure drop. So that valve is huge. Holy crap. I'm sorry, man, I, I have, just curious. I've never seen a CO2 regulator. I'm sure if I look in the in the Hansen book, there's got to be one somewhere. CO2 regulator for what? Like to actually put in a mechanical EPR on there. I mean, I'm sure you could. I mean, like a lot of times they use hydraulic stuff. We just use CVS valves and we just use a loop sequence controller to control it like that. I mean, that's how we usually control the pressure if we if we do have to do it in there. But like they started putting the meat coolers on there and that, that, that becomes a nightmare because there is not enough load to run this to meat cooler. So you end up having to put them both in defrost at the same time. Then your load management on the, on the back end is kind of a nightmare because now when they come out of defrost, you, you come out guns blazing with sure. a meat cooler and a freezer. But if it's not, then you end up with a bunch of nuisance proof alarms. So, I mean, getting that low temp set up is, you know, just bringing it down slowly is, is important. And when you have like a store like a Trader Joe's or like a Aldi where you don't have a lot of load, I mean, until you get that freezer box, I mean, you're pretty much SOL. So, I mean, that freezer box is, you know, that freezer and that freezer box is going to be a lot of your load. So, I mean, until you get that thing all the way cranked down, I mean, I mean, those compressors are going to cycle. It is what it is. So what I generally do is I end up raising the suction pressure up. So I'll raise it up to like 300 pounds. Then I'll step it down to like uh, 2 to 80. I, I try to keep the, the coils running as much as I can. And then just control the box temp off of uh, suction pressure and just put a float in. Hold on. I missed it. Yep. All right, so pulling down, pulling down the um, the walk in, you know, you're gonna basically raise the suction if you happen to have that medium temp on there, raise it up to the same temperature until it pulls down to temperature for X amount of time, you know, you know, 35 or 30 degrees, whatever you're trying to control, and then finally, when it's time to pull the box all the way down to frozen, then you can turn your suction back down and just let the medium temp run as it was. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna have to be a little bit lower in suction. I mean, obviously, it's gotta be able to cycle and have to have some kind of pressure difference there. So I mean, it's going to be a little bit lower in suction. I mean, it just it just takes some time to stage them down. I usually go down to thirty five. Next day, twenty five. Next day, fifteen. Next day, ten, and then I just send it straight from ten down to minus ten. I mean, if it, if it's not if it's not going to crack at ten degrees, it's not going to crack at minus ten degrees. I mean, have you ever seen a slab crack? No. Like um, startup. No, not on startup. No. No, no, I haven't. I think it's uh, almost a myth at this point. No, it's not. I mean, poor, poor insulation will definitely do it. I mean, um, a lot like unfortunately, like the the supermarkets, they don't have heated slabs. But most of the big commercial stuff I've ever been at either has huge four hundred and sixty heaters that are literally running from piece of plastic EMT over, uh, or they're doing some sort of glycol loop um, that they run underneath the slab and they usually power that via the discharge because it just has to be above freezing it doesn't have to be at 80 degrees it just has to be at that point where you're not going to start you know freezing the underground and then basically you know heaving the whole the whole you slab so that's essentially what happens you ever see how target does it they literally like cut up the entire floor mm -hmm. and then dig down way down and then they put a absolutely insane amount of foam insulation like no i haven't it's like it's like a foot thick of foam, like our high R value, like no high R value, like the sheets of foam mm -hmm. and 
concrete rated foam that's made to be buried. Like they put a shit ton of that, and then they put a ton of concrete on top of it. I get which it. Is, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's what Costco and Sam's does too, because those those don't have heated floors. Correct. Correct. So those are just uh, those are just box uh, like massive amounts of foam foam insulation. So after that, we're going to make sure, obviously, that your your expansion valves are, are controlling the superheat the, the way that they're intended. Um, a lot of problems that you will base can have is expansion valves, uh, specifically the electronic bipolar steppers, um, being completely oversized, and it's it's not any fault of anyone. I mean, um, basically, what can happen is. The smallest valve that Sporlin makes for the electronic is an SER AA, which is great, which is fine, but that's the smallest valve they have. But like if you have a case that's way smaller, so if you have, you know, for example, a Husman case, right? If you have a Husman case and, you know, those coils are, you know, only 2,900 BTUs per coil, so that's only, you know, less than a quarter ton. Well, if you put a double A in there, that valve, especially with CO2, might be rated for like 1.2 tons. Um, so what a lot of times what will happen is you'll have, um, it won't control a really good superheat. You'll basically overshoot, it'll start flooding out, and then it'll start clamping down. And then you know, you'll, sometimes you'll see it raise up in the temperatures. Um, it's up to the startup technician to, to kind of pay attention to that and basically go through and make sure that they, they, if they can, depending on the controller, uh, tweak the electronic expansion valve to, you know, give it a, a certain percentage that can only open up to. You say it's up to the technician. It depends on what customer you're at, too, because yeah. certain customers have certain EMS companies to take care of everything, and they want everything to be the same settings, which does not work, obviously, because you can't have all the cases at the same settings. I mean, they're never going to be – cases aren't the same. Hey guys, today's episode is sponsored by Westermeyer Industries Serviceable Oil Floats. Many oil separators contain an oil float to effectively meter separated oil back to the compressors. Westermeyer Industries has taken this concept and perfected it. With their new line of serviceable oil floats, these floats feature an improved design with fewer components, allowing for greater manufacturer consistency, and up to 20% increased oil flow versus their legacy models. These floats also feature an integrated magnet to shield the oil path from debris and have been field proven in supermarket applications. Westmeyer Industries offer replacement oil floats not only for their own separators, but also cross-compatible models for our competitor oil separators as well. You can find out more about the Westermeyer Industries serviceable oil floats by visiting westermeyerind.com backslash floats. Once again, that's westermeyerind.com slash float. Let's get on with the episode. But I will caution you this. Get the rack running halfway decent. Do not spend a ton of time adjusting PIDs and valve percentages and everything on this rack until there's food in it. Do not set all your case controllers up until there's food in the cases because your loads change dramatically. Yeah. Once there's once there's food in the cases, then, you know, and you get some trends for like a day or two, then set your uh your PIDs up and your uh max opens up if you have to or your your average valve percentages. So what I generally do is I'll look at how case runs I mean, here's the problem with most of these case controllers is they're all controlling temperature and superheat. So their main goal is to control superheat. You know, as long as superheat is is not low in a danger zone, then it's going to control temperature. So its goal is to control temperature and superheat. Superheat is the uh, is going to be the uh, <clears throat> driving force at the end of it because if the superheat gets low, it has to shut the valve. But it's also controlling temperature. This is where the big issue with all these valves comes in is a lot of these cases start controlling temperature. These valves were never made to control temperature. So what ends up happening is you start pinching down these valves and you start this vicious cycle of choking down the compressor suction and everything else because all these valves are shutting off because the suction's way too low. So before you guys go and start 
tweaking all these valves, make sure the suction looks good and staying steady, raise it up a little bit. You know, unfortunately, I've only had a few stores where they've actually put in EPRs on these CO2 stores. And I, it's going to start coming more and more because it's, it's just getting cheaper. And people are starting to realize that they're losing the efficiency by not putting EPRs on here. And these case controllers are just controlling off temperature. Like all these manufacturers sold them to, like, oh, they're going to they're going to control temperature and super heat. Everything will be great. But they don't – it's either one or the other. You're either controlling super heat or you're controlling temp because generally – no, all I was going to say is that my wife keeps shaking her ass while I'm trying to record. She's in the office tonight and she just keeps and then flashing me and, and trying to get me to get a reaction. Go ahead. Wow. Continue. Um, so what you want to do is uh, you you want to make sure before you start tuning all these, you get the suction raised up. I mean, there, there's been times where some of these racks come out with a 14 degree suction saturated temperature because that's what the OEM thinks it needs to keep the flash tank at. So they run the saturation way down and okay. So you have this brand new high efficiency, you know, case with a three degree TD and it's running a plus 26 degree evaporator and it's on a, in a rack with a plus 14 degree evaporator. It's going to have no case load. So, I mean, it, it's going to have no load. It's just going to constantly keep cycling. So tuning a case like that is almost impossible. So, I mean, you, would you recommend? Would you recommend just getting the suction as low, or I'm sorry, as high as what you would need in order to maintain your lowest SST? So if we're working on the medium temp, right? Typically, your lowest SST is going to be your meat box, right? Because those have a, about an eight to ten degree TD. So that one's obviously going to have to run the lowest, and usually is set about twenty eight degrees. So you'd get that running where it's maintaining superheat, but barely main, you know, maintaining right on the set point before it's going to cut out. And then at that point, we know that that's going to pull down. So now we you know, we should have a low enough suction to achieve the rest of the case temperatures, which gives you a more constant load. So, yeah, different manufacturers do it different ways. So Microthermal does it kind of – I, I kind of like the way they do their CO2 floating. They look at if the valve is what they call an overflow, meaning like it has low superheat. So – it looks at so many cases that have low superheat. Like, so you can pick like the meat case, the meat bunker, the meat island, whatever, whatever it is. And it'll say, okay, three out of six of these cases has overflow superheat. You know what? Screw the other three. Let's start raising it up a little bit. So it'll start, start floating it up. It's looking at excess superheat. I, I believe it looks at temperature too, but it's looking at excess superheat. So obviously if you have excess superheat, you should have good temperature. Now, obviously, CPC does it a little differently. They just, you float off temperature. But I try to get that SST as high as I can. So, but I, that also means that float case has to be running top notch. Like, I'm talking low superheat, you know, float it down. You also have to make sure you have uh, no piping issues. Um, typically, I mean, so on a typical DX rack, you know, two two pounds between, you know, the, uh, the rack and the, and the case is normal. What are you seeing out there on the transcritical since you work on it way more than I do? I mean, two to 10 pounds. I mean, you got to remember two pounds over, you know, uh, two pounds on a 20 pound suction is a lot. 10 pounds on a 400 pound suction is not really not that much. If you really look at the CO2 chart, it's not that much. I'm going to call Joe. I'm curious what they, what I'm, you know, I'm sure that they engineer it for a certain pressure drop, you know what I mean? Cause they would have to size the piping. So I'm kind of curious what kind of pressure drop they're looking for on CO2. Like when they engineer it, and the lower the pressure drop, always the better. I mean, I agree. So, I mean, now you're, a number though. Yeah. I mean, now you're just talking like the, the cost of install, but I mean the cost to install the, you know, on an HFC or HCFC to get that pressure drop down low. I mean, you're talking blowing up the suction lines, you know, you're talking a lot of money on a CO2 rack. I mean, the biggest suction line on like a decent sized store we have up here is like inch and five for like the main trunk back to the rack. And that's I mean, doing a shit ton of BTUs too. I mean, an Aldi is like inch and or seven eighths and inch and eighth. 
Damn. Is bit, inching an eighth is out of the rack, like to the back room, and it's seven eighths the rest of the store, picking up the rest of the store. So okay. that's nothing. I mean, so you're you're talking tiny lines. But yeah, I mean you wanna you wanna really tune that one case out and then you want to try to get that SST as high as you can. Now there becomes a point where you need at least 75, 70 to 75 pounds of pressure to push oil and make compressors. So that flash tank needs to be 70 to 75 pounds above the medium temp suction. This is where you hit this fine line dancing at. You you got to have that 75 pounds in there. People say it's 100. That's upset. I mean, it's obscene. Like I, I 50 is like where it starts getting dicey. I usually like to keep it like 70, 75 pounds. So I like to run my flash tanks higher. So running the flash tanks higher gives you two, two things for you. Okay, it's increasing your uh, it's increasing your pressure difference, so you get a little bit of better oil in there. Now you could run the medium temp suction up higher. You're going to save more energy. It's you know for every degree you raise it up, it's two percent. So, I mean, it's a lot. So if you go from fifteen degrees to twenty degrees, I mean, you just made that rack ten to fifteen percent more efficient. So. And then also you're taking load off the medium temp by raising the flash tank pressure up a little bit. So that gives you a little bit of extra capacity when it's hotter out. Now you're, now you're, you're bypassing less flash gas into those compressors because you raised up that flash tank set point. Now that high pressure valves open a little more, you're doing less uh, flash evaporation and you're going to run a little bit more efficiently because you're now you have it saying that a 40% of gas going out of that flash tank, to the medium temp may be only 35 now. So you got a little bit less load in there. So, I mean, so assume that assume that your suction pressure is 420, and so basically you would need uh, you said 75 pounds, so that's nine nine uh, four uh, 495 on your on your flash tank. Then you'd be straight with that. I usually shoot 515. It's been like my our magic number lately. 515 sure. to 520. So that way we can get that suction a little higher. I mean. Some stores, I mean, we're getting away with a plus 26 degree evaporator. Gotcha. I mean, it really depends what's on there. <clears throat> on the store where the, like a lot of these stores, they've been putting the meat coolers on the low temp side. So, I mean, that way the, the, the meat coolers on the low temp rack and that way you can get the SST a little bit higher. So that way it runs a little bit smoother because now that, that SST is a. Uh, so then you're. That means you would also have to figure out where you're going to adjust your oil pressure regulator as well, correct? Because if you, you know, you're going to set it, what, usually about 100 pounds higher than that, correct? There's no oil regulator. It's off the flash tank pressure. Oh, see, the, L the LMP racks have the uh, have an oil pressure regulator that has to be set. So the LMP racks have a oil drain pressure regulator. So the way that works is... Right out of the uh, bottom of the separator, they aren't using a, a drain solenoid. I like it to a point. I just find that it moves a lot. Um, the oil level moves moves a lot. No, like the 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 regulator. I've had to set them like multiple times. Oh, so, they they drift. Yeah, they, they drift. Yeah, they drift. So what what they're doing is it's a hydraulic valve, uh, and they're draining constantly out of the bottom of the separator. I think. To be honest, this works great for the fact that they're constantly draining the separator, but it's also a constant load. And if it does fuck up, it like literally like tanks the low, the medium temp compressors because it just starts blowing hot gas into the suction. So what they're doing is, I've seen it two different ways. I've seen it where they come out of the bottom of the oil separator, they go through this high deck valve or high high deck or high. I think it's high deck. They go through this high deck uh, pressure regulating valve, and it's an outlet pressure regulator, and it's trying to maintain. Um, I think the one we had was 100 pounds over suction. I've seen them 100 pounds over flash tank. I've seen them where they're piped into the suction or the flash tank. So what it's doing is, it's constantly venting off the receipt the oil res receiver into the uh, flash tank. So it's just a constant flow from discharge vapor out of the bottom of the oil separator, it's constantly draining oil and then back into the uh, the tank, the oil reservoir tank, and then dumps from the oil reservoir tank into the uh, flash tank, which is, you know, five, 
hundred pounds. So you're going from a thousand pounds to 500 pounds. So you have that pressure difference. So they're moving any little bit of oil that's in the bottom of that thing. We had less oil problems with those than any of them. I mean, the optical eyes and the pulse valves, it, the pulsing valves, they are a nightmare when they come transcritical. They need longer pulse times. I mean, because you're moving so much oil, that high deck valve doesn't care. All it cares about is the outlet pressure, right? The outlet pressure, and it's constantly draining every bit of oil. So, I mean, it's very simple how it works. And I, it, it's, I like it. I just don't like the fact that we've had to adjust them so many times. Like they've drifted a lot. On most of the racks that you work on, they have the the, the basically the oil manifold, or are they all, all going now to the OMC? Um, depends. I mean, s- some of the older ones uh, had the MT oil system. I mean, some of them had that older uh, oil manifold, the pulse valves. I mean, the OMCs are taking over, though. Like, it's so much simpler. I mean, let's just be honest. Guys struggle enough with EMS. I mean – why not just take it out of the equation completely and put the OMCs on there? We have had a lot fail though. What the OMCs? <laughs> yes. We've had problems with the high pressure ones sticking open and uh, filling the compressors full and uh, blowing head gaskets. Now the, the, you know what the equation that they use is, is kind of tricky until you go through it a couple of times and tr- try to well, figure out, you know, how it's actually. Because you know. they just keep changing it. Oh, so it's not the same thing that it was, you know, two years ago. Nope. That certain manufacturers changed it, and then they came in, you know, under cover of darkness and changed them again. Because usually, what the compressor solenoids are, are powered on for thirty seconds, and then de-energized for thirty seconds for the the whole sixty second cut, right? Depends on what whose it is. Okay. I mean, I, I've seen Kaiser Warren do them longer. I've seen Zero Zone do them less time. I've seen Voldemort. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Where the hell's my button? I don't know, but you're really bad at this. If you ever had to like bleep things out in like real life, you would be fired. <laughs> well, there's usually, there's usually a delay. Like there's usually a delay between recording and when it actually goes out. So you know, there's time for someone to catch it i'll put it back in post we'll be fine it'll be good i just like the sound <laughs> oh, lose my mind um oil so, oil. We're talking about oil oh yeah i mean obviously that is going to be a huge thing is that like, after this thing's running for a little bit make sure it's topped off on oil make sure make sure everything's good and uh not going to be a problem with uh, low oil, I mean, especially in the middle of night, night curtains in some of these racks. Oh, I heard that's been an issue. Yeah, in every store. See, there, there, there should be a night. Well, can you resolve that? So what, what Kevin's referring to is uh, a lot of times what happens is a lot of these customers have the curtains, right? And the racks are designed to be under a certain load, you know, whatever that case is. Well, as we discussed in other podcasts, typically when you, you know, put doors on a case it'll reduce the load down to about 35 percent of what it originally was now these are curtains so you're obviously not gonna you know reduce you know 65 percent of the load but you're gonna really reduce the amount of that open case a lot so what happens is then you basically end up you know short cycling some compressors or cycling off the rack because it's not it's not it doesn't have enough load could you do like so if you if you knew what time that they would put their curtains up, couldn't you basically put in a nighttime setback float on the medium temp? Um, yeah, you 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 probably could because if you would just raise that pressure, well, no, you couldn't do that because the, potentially you wouldn't be able to keep the differential between your flash tank and your medium temp suction at that you know, uh, 75 pounds, or the, at least that would be your limit on how, how high you could raise that suction up at, correct? Um, the, the, the highest you can raise the suction is your, is your PI, PSD across from your oil pressure. You want to explain that a little bit? Your, your limiting factor in your float is your, is your pressure drop across from your oil to your medium temp suction. hundred percent. That gets your, that's your limiting factor. It's got to be at least 75 pounds. So you're not going to feed oil or, or your valves are going to feed really crappy. 
Because remember, once that pressure drop starts going down, your valve sizing starts getting affected. So it's a, you're walking a fine line on keeping those valves feeding and then keeping the oil going to the medium temp compressors. So if you just go ahead and you know fling it with a 35-pound float, it's probably not going to work out that great. Raising it up slowly. I'll usually raise up the minimum suction pressure. So say if it's running at a plus 15, I'll, I'll raise it to a plus 18. Then I'll put the float from plus 18 to like, say, plus 24 and let it let it float up. And then I'll put the float interval at like two minutes. So it, it's going to raise and lower faster. So if we do have an issue, it's not like five or ten minutes. I mean, it's going to raise or lower faster. But you, you're walking that fine line. You don't want to really step the liquid pressure to suction pressure difference down to below 75, 70 pounds. That's when you start having issues. Especially if you have long lines, that's where you're, the cases you're going to start running into issues at your end of your line or your loops. You start maybe have a little bit more pressure drop on a liquid line, get a little bit more flash gas out that way. If you remember, the, most of this gas liquid is very poor, extremely poor subcooling, maybe a degree, half a degree. I mean, we're, we're making this back 90% of the year, we're making this back into a liquid. You know, we're flashing it back into a liquid. So, I mean, yeah, the tank is cold at the bottom and, you know, it's flashing out. You're picking up a little bit of subcooling, but it's not like subcooling that's coming out of the condenser or like a subcooler. That, that, that's where you're losing that efficiency at. So, I mean, long lines, you may have some flash gas in there. Because okay. typically, typically on the 326 or the core link control or the, the iPro controller, you're typically trying the high pressure valve below transcritical. We're trying to maintain three degrees of, of subcooling typically on those controllers, correct? Usually it's it's about three. It changes the algorithm when it's transcritical. Well, uh, yeah. It's, it's everybody just, has a different set point. Microthermals is different. Danfoss is different. I've yet to get into the iPro to see what the subcooling. I've been trying to read through all the Italian. God, you're so slow with it. Typically, typically you're you're going to try to control that three degrees of subcooling, and then once, so the the abatic condensers, the the BAC ones at least that I know of, those typically have a five degree TD. So once you hit, you know, eighty two degrees outside, you hit that eighty seven degree supercritical point, and you're no longer you know making that three degrees of subcooling. It's just going to try to achieve whatever the algorithm is trying to make it do at that pressure at that temperature outside. Yeah, I mean, it's in that three degrees of subcooling. Is it really three degrees of subcooling? Nobody really knows because every proprietary chart. I'm going to make one up. I mean, you basically could. I mean, probably. I mean, it, it's all proprietary. I mean, Dan, well, Dan, they probably just stole Dan Foss's chart. I mean, Dan Foss's chart works great. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, we should probably stop this and we'll make it a part three. You think? Yeah. Do you want to talk about the Trillium real quick and how that operates? I wish I could because we don't have any. We we only have Gutner pump and dumps. That's all you have? Yeah. I've I've seen one Trillium up here and it's on uh like a standard rack. Like every one of the ones we have up here are Gutners. But they're corporate US offices up here, so all right, well, I'll do some I'll do some digging and we'll uh we'll go through some of the set points and stuff that, that are in there. Why don't we make a third episode about the gas coolers? Yeah. Because uh, you can do the BACs and I'll do the Gutners. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? What? What is your name? Tony. Fuck you, Tony. What's your name? Ezekiel. Fuck you, Ezekiel. <laughs> Fuck you! Fuck you! And you know what I did last night? You better not break my mother into this! You know what I did? You better not! I broke that fly over there. Oh! And I fucked your mother next to it. Fuck you, Ezekiel! Fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you.